the food or the food web of the ocean. So today is going to look at the um, how energy in the ocean is moved around, where the energy comes from, things like that. Um, looking at some of the animals and things that live in the ocean too. Now, obviously, this is not an animal class, so we're not going to get really into depth with the animals. Um, you can do zoology if you want to learn that stuff. All right. So energy in the ocean. When we talk about energy, energy is just the ability to do work. And this makes complete sense when you think about it because um, calories that you get from your food is actually just energy. And the calories is how much our body uses the energy. So um, you look at how much calories is in a piece of food. And that's how much energy your body can get from it. When you are exercising, you look at how many calories you burn. That's how much energy you and so energy is our ability to do work. And all animals have a limited supply of energy. And all animals, including humans, they try to get the most they can for the least amount of effort. If we could all sit around and do nothing and get paid for it, we would love that. Yeah. Most amount we can for the least amount of effort. What a lot of people do. A lot of people do. They inherit money, especially. I'm not here. I'm Um, energy is used for all kinds of things. It's used for reproduction, growth, movement, eating, maintaining our bodies, um, all of these things. Anything an animal does, they have to think, okay, is it worth it? Is it worth spending the energy to do this? Is it worth it? Is it worth spending the energy to get out of here? I just the same thing that I did yesterday. I threw on a pair of jacket that was FedEx and the one that was in my house. It works, it works. I couldn't sleep all night. I was like, oh, I at 3 o'clock in the morning. I know it's not going to have to be scared. I fell asleep on the couch at 7. I was not planning to, but I sat down to read a book and then I was out. And so my husband was really nice. He put the kids and stuff to bed for me. But um, yeah, I was out. <laughs> and then I slept and I woke up this morning and I was still tired. I don't know what that was. Hopefully, I'm not getting sick because everybody else seems to be getting sick. No, <laughs> Alright, anyway, the first law of thermodynamics states that energy cannot be created or destroyed. This is true. Energy cannot be created and you cannot destroy it. Basically what we see happening is that energy changes its form. So we eat food to get energy. We don't destroy it, but we use that energy for other things. Um, anytime the plants don't make energy, they get their energy from the sun. So they're taking sun energy and turning it into other energy. So energy is never destroyed. It's never created. It just kind of changes form. So for us, we do have to eat to obtain our energy. But energy, like for plants, they get it from the sun. Um, there is energy in sound. I mean, if you've ever felt the bass speaker and felt it vibrate, there's energy in sound. There's energy in light. There's energy in chemicals in our body. All of these things can make energy. So energy can start as one thing, but like sunlight doesn't do us any good. I mean, we can't go out. Well, we can't go outside and stand in the sun and make energy like plants. Yeah, we don't get vitamin D. You do get vitamin D, but that's a little bit different. Also, mm -hmm. And we stick tan, <laughs> which causes skin cancer. You want to see my um, sure. burn from the sun? No, not even the sun. Sunburns and causes skin cancer. You can get tans burning. Anytime you get too much exposure to the sun um, so over I'll time. Add, so, like Africans have skin cancer? Their skin has more melanin, and that extra melanin um, helps protect their skin better. It's, it's pretty bad. It is blister and peel. It is pretty bad. I've been redder than that, though. Ouch. <laughs> I burnt the tops of my ears once. That was from June. Really painful. When I was younger, I used to burn so really, really good. Um, I, whenever I was younger, I used to tan. I didn't burn. And then I stopped going outside. And now I just burn. I think in the now, it's becoming more, it's, it's less likely for people to like go to a tanning bed and purposefully go out and tan, and it's more common to get like spray tans and stuff like that. No, it's I don't like spray tans. I'm 
saying it's more fun. I'm not saying it's all the way gone. I got I saw him building something. I was talking to a girl that was a lifeguard and I was getting free of the pool, so I just for like three weeks they were sent to me. Talking to a girl that was a lifeguard. It's talking, huh? Anyways, um, plankton, we mentioned yesterday, they're the organisms that float around the ocean, typically unable to swim against the currents. They are not strong enough to move on their own. I mean, they do move, but they're not strong enough to fight the currents on their own. So they get caught up in the ocean currents and drift around. Um, a lot of times they're found in, they're found in all different parts of the ocean and there are specific nets that can actually catch these. And um, the nets are really, really fine to catch a lot of these little tiny creatures in them. This is just some examples. You can see here, there's lots of little plankton. This is the eye of a needle, so this is zoomed in. And so they're really, really small, and a lot of them can live in a single drop of water. Um, here are some plankton nets, and so they're very, very fine nets that allow the water to get through, but the little plankton get caught in them. So there are two types of plankton. There's phytoplankton and zooplankton. Phytoplankton are plant ones, and zooplankton are animal types. Um, phyto for plant and zo for zoology for animals. So these two types are both drifting in the ocean and they also drift in fresh waters as well. So if you went to the Missouri River or any of these little creeks or things around here, you're going to find these different types of plankton. Um, they all have individual names and plankton is really just kind of like a blanket term that describes them. Mm -hmm. Pretty much, because it wanders with the currents. So plankton is an amphibian? The zooplankton is. That is living. And actually, plants are living too. They're just not animals. But plants are alive. Yeah, so like, mm -hmm. when they kill plants,
and that creates kind of this red color when they congregate in that area. Red tides aren't necessarily safe because once they become red, then it's difficult for other animals to live in that area. So they kind of, even though it's caused by lots of nutrients, these dinoflagellates come in and take all the nutrients, leaving it kind of barren for others. This is what they look like. Here's a diatom, kind of cool pattern that they have. And here's a flagellate, and they've got the little whip-like tail that helps them to move from place to place. So red tide is a lot of get the picture. There we go. Um, a lot of dinoflagellates. They don't know for sure what causes them, but again, it's kind of linked to increase of nutrients. So if there's like fertilizers that were in the ground, and those fertilizers were carried to the water by a river, by runoff, by rain, then that dinoflagellates um, are gonna come and eat those nutrients. And then it's not a good sign because you don't want them clustered in such high concentrations there. Because then it makes it so that other animals aren't gonna be able to survive there either. is affected by three things, latitude, seasons, and upswelling, which is waves against the shore. Um, so all of these things can play an impact on how much plankton is in an area. The latitude, again, is the north to south, how high up you go, and the seasons as well. These things are going to do better in warmer conditions. Typically, animals survive better when things are warm, and not as many of these are going to be found in colder areas. So you can see on these maps that areas that have um, higher distributions are gonna be like along the coast areas and not as much out in the deep ocean. Also an important thing to remember about energy, you probably remember this back from elementary school days, is that energy only flows in one direction. It only goes up the food chain. Now there are some nutrients that can be cycled and go in a cycle like carbon in the water cycle, for instance, um, but energy is not like that. Energy only goes up the food chain and by the time it gets to the top of the food chain, it's gone and more energy has to be created. And that's why plants and the sun are so important because without the sun, to give the energy, without the plants to turn it into energy we can use, then we would run out of energy very, very quickly because we can't recycle energy. It goes up and it goes away. Um, now, again, thinking back to it can't really be destroyed, energy is lost as heat and it goes off into the environment as heat. So as we eat food, only a little bit of it gets transferred up the food chain and most of that energy is lost to the environment as heat. Um, an example, once you fill up your car with gas and use it, you, the gas doesn't come back unless you put more in it. It can't recycle that gas and use that gas again. The energy is gone. And this is just showing how the energy moves up the food chain. So producers, if they had a thousand calories and then the consumers, the insects and things that eat the grass, they only get a hundred of that. The secondary consumers, they only get 10% and then by the time you get to the top of the food chain, there's only 1% of energy left. So the energy really drops off each level. So only 10% of the available
available energy transfers from one level to the next, and 90% of it is going to be lost as heat. So that's again just important to remember why we are constantly hungry. We're hungry because we use up that energy, the energy doesn't go any, or it gets lost, and so we can't make our own, so we need to get more food in order to replace that energy that's being lost. Now the ocean food chain starts with plankton, especially the phytoplankton, because the sun has to be able to um, get the energy in the water somehow, and that's where photosynthesis happens. And this provides the energy for the rest of the ocean. So it starts with the phytoplankton. The phytoplankton are at the bottom of the food chain there, and this is going to allow other animals to eat more. And this is also why we mentioned this the other day, that large animals like whales can survive by eating small animals, because those little animals, the plankton, they have a lot of energy to give. They haven't lost that energy as it gets lost as we move up the food chain. So even though they're small, they have a high percentage of energy that they can offer to whatever eats them. So krill have a lot of energy since they're really low on the food chain. And again, we mentioned this the other day that it's important for us to eat um, fruits and vegetables because they have a lot of energy to give us. Yes, meat is good, but it doesn't have as much energy to give us because it's further up on the food chain. Also, why some um, places around the world eat bugs on a regular basis. They're low on the food chain, so they have good energy. Well, I can match that bad. Mm -hmm. I've had bugs before. I've had bugs before. I've had bugs before. We have mealworms. I've eaten mealworms. I mean, crickets, any other things, grasshoppers, and grasshoppers turn into like a powder in the food chain. Hmm. That's interesting. I've eaten the mealworms, but that's all. I know they make chocolate covered. The scorpions are further up on the food chain, so because they are predators, so they wouldn't have quite as much energy to offer as like a cricket or a grasshopper would. It's very quiet when Justin's gone, huh?